So hello everyone and good morning and welcome to another masterclass of the core masterclass series. Today we have a very special guest, I would say, uh, a friend and, and uh, kind of a shaker and mover when it comes to the product-led growth conversation. I used to say growth hacking and then Tam corrected me and he's like, growth hacking is not sustainable. So let's call it a product-led growth approach. Uh, uh, just to give you a kind of 30,000 feet of view on, on what we're intending to do with TEM. Uh, TEM is going to be delivering a, a thematic component focused on product and product-led growth. Uh, and and uh, there are around seven sessions uh, or eight sessions that TEM will be delivering between master classes and deep dives. Today's session is more of a master class, a very high level kind of one and a half hour a session and we're going to be discussing accelerating business growth strategy and techniques but later on in, in the upcoming master classes we'll be discussing uh, the business growth with ai uh, uh, mastering product-led growth uh, unlocking exponential revenue growth and so forth and just to give you a brief before i pass the ball to tam uh, about tam uh, tam help uh, companies and, and, and entrepreneurs achieve fast and consistent growth. Uh, 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 he's worked with, with many startups over the years and uh, all across the world uh, in different geographies. Uh, he's met like all the metrics uh, that you can envision when it comes to, to, to accelerating growth for companies and optimizing revenues. Uh, uh, Tem uh, has worked in, in as, as, as far to my knowledge, Tem, before you, you relocate to Budrum, has worked in three geographies. Uh, and he's been uh, delivering kind of advisory services and sessions uh, for clients all over the world. Uh, it's not our first time dealing with them. Them has delivered a series of sessions uh, in the previous cohort. And I'm going to tell you one thing about it. It's one of the most important, uh, uh, you know, hands-on uh, tactical sessions that I advise all of the startups uh, uh, to, to, to listen for, uh, to, to focus on. And in case you need any advisory services on one-on-one -on -one with Tim, please feel free to reach out via Airtable and uh, Nadine. Tim, without further ado, my friend, uh, the stage is yours, the floor is yours. So please. Razek, thank you so much for the intro. Can everybody hear me, see me well? Do a thumbs up. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Yes, I think Razek did a really good intro. And as he said, um, you know, it's not the first time uh, they've been dealing with me, even if I'm very difficult to deal with. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we've, we've we've had a bit of history together at HTU, the core program. Uh, and I did a few sessions, went quite well. So we're back with even more sessions now this time. I'm quite excited. Uh, just to uh, summarize a little bit uh, what Rezek said, yeah, I uh, it's been 20 years that I was abroad. I'm half Turkish, half French. I just got back to Turkey to Bodrum about eight months ago because I have a little baby girl that is two years old. And I was like, shit, we need family. <laughs> so so then I came and I, and I got close to my family so that we can get some help. Uh, before that, I was in um, six years in Barcelona where I helped a lot of startups, a lot of B2B SaaS, uh, general SaaS, just any B2C SaaS as well. Uh, a lot of deep tech companies. So I've done computer vision, a uh, company for real estate. I've done big data for telcos. Uh, I've done marketing automation platform for e-com. I've done real estate portals. Um, I think I've done about 25 or so startups. I was a growth consultant in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, before that, I was eight years in London. Uh, in London, I was much more in the media production uh, media industries, media companies, and so on. As you can see, I think on my sides, there is some music equipment and DJing equipment. I'm actually a sound engineer by university. Uh, but after that, uh, my interest in tech companies and growth and marketing uh, grew so much that this just became a hobby now. Uh, so it's just Friday and Saturday nights. Um, and then the rest, I work now as the CEO of Task Drive. Uh, before London, I was uh, six years in Los Angeles, uh, where I was actually selling carpets, door-to-door uh, -door carpets, uh, when there was not even much internet. I think it was just like the first 
the first days of Facebook, you know, uh, you had to be invited and so on. And I used to go knock on doors and sell carpets, Turkish, um, Persian uh, carpets. Um, that was difficult. I can tell you that. <laughs> so um, and before that, I grew up in Istanbul where I went to a French school. Uh, so that's kind of me. Um, and um, with today, uh, we're going to go. Let me see if we can open it. I'm doing, I'm doing new trick. It's the first time I'm presenting on Canvas, so hopefully it's going to work okay. Um, but today we're going to talk about accelerating business growth, uh, some strategies and techniques. But really, I want to dig into the core as the core program. I really want to dig into the core of a growth mindset and how to think about growth in a company, how to establish growth and so on. As Rezek said, this is a masterclass, so we're not going to go uh, very deep, but I think there's going to be a lot of value you're going to get out of it. So I do recommend you to take some notes, ask me questions at the end, you know, note down the questions and so on. If you want to, uh, if you think you're going to forget the question, you don't want to write it down, put it on the chat. I'll, I'll read it. And as we maybe at some point, if it makes sense with the slide, I can uh, try to answer that question as we go. If not, uh, at the end, we're going to keep some time for Q&A. Uh, cool. And one thing that I love, if you have good internet and you're presentable, you know, turn on your cameras because I can all see you all here on the left. I see my presentation on there. It's lovely to see people's faces. It's always, um, I see nice smiles. So that uh, makes me really happy. Um, and then it doesn't feel like I'm just talking to myself, right? Um, cool. So um, let's get down to magic. So what we're going to do, uh, let's talk about the learning objectives and outcomes. I, I'm sure you've seen it, but let's remind ourselves what we're going to uh, go through today and what we're going to learn. Uh, so we're going to really dive, I think, in the growth mindset to drive business success, the key elements of an effective growth strategy. Uh, we're going to learn how to acquire and retain customers. So when we say learn how to is more, you're going to learn how to make strategies and think about um, acquisition and retention, which is very important. In the deep dive, there's a deep dive for this that we're really going to dig. Uh, and then you're going to be able to plan out and strategize. So come to other other sessions as well. Let's promote the other sessions while we're here. Um, we're going to discover monetization strategies from different companies, different industries, some big some big players and so on. We're going to analyze successful case studies and, and then we're going to talk about, you know, what's a growth plan for your business. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'm ready. If you're ready, I'm ready. So let's go do this. So the fixed mindset, right? So I'm going to I'm going to uh, do fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. I had a fixed mindset a long time ago, and but then I realized that I did have a little bit of a growth mindset in my head, but I didn't officialize it. And then I, when I officialized it, everything changed, right? So um, what's the belief of a fixed mindset? As you can see, is the abilities and intelligence are static and unchangeable. It's the people that says, you know, this is me. I can't do more kind of thing. You know, the challenges, they tend, they tend to avoid challenges and fearing failure, right? So this is a fixed mindset. The efforts, they view efforts as fruitless or worse. Criticism, they ignore feedback and constructive criticism. Uh, the success of others, they feel threatened by the success of others. Uh, in the development side, they may plateau early and achieve less than full potential. And the resilience it gives up easily in the face of obstacles. I was a bit like this, okay? Um, so let me see if I can give you a couple more examples there. You know, it's like avoiding tasks that are challenging for fear of not being able to complete them. Yeah. So I was like that kind of in the early days of school and so on. Uh, giving up when a task becomes difficult or frustrating. Uh, ignoring or dismissing feedback because it is seen as a critique of their innate abilities, right? So uh, good feedback is very important. Constructive feedback is very important. Feeling jealous or threatened by the success or abilities of others. This is a fixed mindset, okay? But we all have the potential to change this and to go to a growth mindset. Okay, the growth mindset, the belief is that the abilities and intelligence can be developed with effort and persistence. Okay, the challenges is they embrace challenges as opportunities for learning and growth. And this is really, I think, very important to remember. Uh, the effort, they see effort as a path to mastery and growth, right? To mastery and growth. It takes, you know, they say it takes 10,000 hours to learn something. And this is very true. So don't expect that you've done 10 hours and you're like, oh, I couldn't do it. Let me give up. That doesn't exist. Um, the criticism is important here. Learn from feedback and constructive criticism. A lot of people, I'm sorry, but they're not good at giving feedback, but still listen to them, 
ask questions, you can direct that feedback into more constructive feedback. Um, the success of others, they find inspiration and learning opportunities in the success of others. Okay, Instead of being jealous and so on, we find success in the others. We get inspired by others. Development continues to learn and improve throughout life. This is 100% me, guys. Is you know, uh, every three to six months, I learn something new. You know, my latest uh, gadget obviously has been ChatGPT. I think it's been about six, seven months that you know, every day, two to three hours, I do ChatGPT. Uh, hopefully, you'll come to the AI for business. Um, you know, there's massive potential in that. Um, I'm a freak about it. So, if you need anything about it, you know, just just let me know. Uh, development continues to learn and improve throughout life. Uh, you know, I'm 35, but I feel like, you know, I have so much more room uh, to learn and it's not going to stop. And I have a daughter now, so I have to learn even more so I can help her learn more. You know, if you do start thinking about like that, that's where you find your growth mindset. The resilience, they show resilience and perseverance in the face of setbacks. Challenges, setbacks, failures is where we have growth. When you get out of your comfort zone, that's where you're going to grow. Okay, um, just a very quick example before we dig into uh, some visual examples. Um, seeking out new challenges is opportunity for learning and personal growth. Working hard and persisting, even when tasks are difficult or frustrating, right? This is the opposite of the fixed mindset that we've been speaking just before. Actively seeking feedback and using it to improve their skills and abilities. I think this is very important. Um, you know, I, I aim now to sit at tables with people much more intelligent than me where I feel stupid. If I feel stupid at a table, that means I'm at the correct place, right? Because that means that people are even higher than me and I'm going to learn a lot. And it's very good to get into this, um, you know, uh, where you're out of your comfort zone and people are talking about such smart stuff and I'm like, shit, I don't know anything, you know. And before that, I used to feel uncomfortable. Now I love that. I'm like, oh, this is this is my comfort zone because I'm learning so much. Um, finding inspiration in the achievements of others and seeing them as a learning opportunity. Okay. So I'm going to go now to, to uh, some people say it's a horrible example. I think it is a, a bit horrible, um, but I think it's a really good example of, of a growth mindset. Okay. Uh, I've had people say, oh, this is disgusting. So brace yourselves. So this is uh, Takeru Kobayashi, Takeru Kobayashi, a Japanese uh, guy who entered a hot dog eating um, competition in the US, right? In the US, there is hot dog eating competition. How crazy, but that's the US. Let's not get into that, right? How crazy the US is. But uh, Takeru Kobayashi, what he's done is that as a skinny man that just entered the competition, he won him and he's really changed the scale, which I'm going to show you now. So what he started to do is to experiment everybody every big guy you know they were eating one hot dog with the bun and everything like that and they were eating let's say 17 hot dogs in the given time Takeru Kobayashi started to to dissect the whole thing right he took he took the um, he took the sausages out he dipped the bun into the water because you're allowed water bun and sausage right and you have to finish those things and he started dipping it the bun would get softer it would be easier to chew he could get two uh, two two hot dogs at the same time and he's really brought the scale that usually it'll be about, you know, a 12, 15. He's brought, he's brought it to 30 plus in the same given time. Why did he do that? Just by experimenting, right? By just trying new things. It's a horrible example, but this is the easiest example of a growth mindset, right? The skinny guy coming in first time winning the hot dog competition okay uh so we call it the kobayashi scale because it's in the experimentation mindset i think you know he tried so many things and then he found a solution that everybody you know these big guys were like oh my god how can he eat this many hot dogs right so he's changed the game right and that's growth mindset that's experimenting so change the game try new things you know uh, don't look at what others do and don't do the same thing right um so the you're going to ask me what's the difference about growth and marketing very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to dive into it a tiny bit. You know, the mar marketing mindset is campaigns, which I'm sure that a lot of you are like, oh, marketing, we're going to make campaigns and so on. But when we talk about growth, it's not campaigns, right? Because campaigns would last six months, a year and so on. But growth is experiments. We experiment every two weeks. We find new things to do, right? Every two weeks you experiment, you see it doesn't work, you delete it. OK, but when you have a quarterly budget on a campaign, you've wasted your whole quarter. Don't do that. Uh, the objectives of a marketing team or a marketing mindset is usually awareness and acquisition. And that is not more. But when we say growth, we really talk about acquisition, activation, retention, how to retain the clients as well and how to upsell, renew and so on. The revenue itself 
and the referral, right? You've heard a lot of marketing teams tell you about MQLs, marketing qualified leads, and they wouldn't care about the rest. That's, I think that's very, very old school. Don't do that. Think about the whole, the the, the whole pipeline, the whole funnel, the whole journey. Are right? we gonna even look why not funnels? Uh, the team composition of a marketing team is just marketers. All right, it's people that does marketing. In a growth team, what we do is we do multidisciplinary teams. We have a marketing person, we have a developer, we have analysts, we have user experience people, right? They get together to create experiments, okay? And experiments could be to change your login. Experiments could be uh, many, many th referral programs and so on. And if you're just a marketing team, then you're waiting for the dev team and so on. But if you're a growth team that has the dev, then they'll be able to, oh, I'll, co I'll code this in, in a day or two, right? So the process of a marketing team, again, I repeat, is campaigns. And a growth team is data-driven experiments, okay? Or I call them data-informed, which we're going to look in another session. Um, and that's what I mentioned, right, about budgets. You know, a marketing budget is the red one. It's, you know, a start to end is a big budget. Uh, and an iterative learning budget is a, is, is a growth budget, which is small, small money. And then when you see something works, you start scaling the budget into that experiment. Like, oh, this works really well. Why don't we throw more money at it? Right. So don't spend all your budget, uh, cut it down into pieces, experiment with it and scale it. And I'm guessing that this is what everybody thinks in a marketing. It's awareness, the website visits, acquisition, the signups, and then revenue, monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue or whatever the dollar sign is. Right. Whatever, how total revenue and so on, however, however you calculate that. This is a marketing funnel. Right. But growth people will start thinking about about this. You know, the website visit goes into signups. The signups, after that, they've signed up for your platform, for your tool, for your service. But is there an activation? Because how many times, I've done it many times, you sign up for something and you don't use it. But if you look at signups, you're like, oh, I have 1,000 signups. And it's like, yeah, but 1,000 signups, you have maybe five people using it actively. So when you start about activation, right, that's where uh, really growth comes in. Do they integrate their websites? Do they activate a campaign throughout your platform? Whatever uh, you find, what is activation, right? So that they see the value in the product and not just in the sign up process. Retention, you know, I don't know who knows Dao, Wao, Mao, but this is, you know, daily active users, weekly active users, monthly active users. These are important stuff. Some, some uh, for some platform, you don't want them to be daily active users because maybe it's a weekly a journaling thing you know it's maybe it's a sunday preparation tool uh, if that's the case you do not want them uh, you do not want them to uh, to be active daily but if they're active weekly you're good to go or monthly right uh referrals referrals and invites and again where which they're they're in darker because activation and revenue for growth it's uh it's major uh major areas where you can experiment and where you can scale your activities um, this brings me to a great um, quote that I love from somebody that I don't like. Okay, I don't like Jeff Bezos. Okay, but I love what he said here. He said, "Our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per week, and per day." Right? Being wrong might hurt you, but being slow will kill you. Right? I just want to repeat that. And being wrong might hurt you but being slow will kill you, okay? So you are all startups going through an accelerated program. Don't be slow, all right? Don't be slow, okay? Be wrong. That's okay. If you're wrong, that means you're trying something. If you're trying something, a few things are not going to work, and one thing is going to work, and it's going to fix all those things that didn't work. So you're suddenly going to be like, oh, I tried 10 things, didn't work. I tried one thing, worked, but I've scaled my company, right? And there you're going to be happy. Okay, so don't. It's one of the best quotes that I like from from the person that I don't like. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so now we're gonna dig a little bit. What's very important that we all forget when we create startups, and I've done it myself. Even recently, I, I completely forgot about this again, and then I reminded myself, and things changed a lot. And that's user research. Okay, you really need to know your users. You really need to know them. That's it. You have to know them. Because if you don't know them and you make just assumptions, you're not going to get far. But if you get to know them and you do your user research really well, you're going to understand how to solve their problems. Okay. So 
you know, the problem statement, you have to have a problem statement. And as a startup, as a company, you're here to solve a problem, okay? You want to be a painkiller and not a vitamin, okay? Because a vitamin is a good to have, but it's not a must have. But if you're a painkiller, you're killing the pain, it's a must have. That's, you know, big companies are painkillers. They're not vitamins, okay? I know the vitamin industry is very good at the moment and everybody loves vitamins, but that's a completely different game. And so your problem statement, it's its a document, it's a living document that all your company, all your team members, your founders, everybody, your investors, everybody should know. What are you tackling? What's the goals of the product? The problem, the product will solve and a vision for a solution. Okay. So there is a really nice little um, framework out there. Okay. A little, little table kind of thing uh, out there. Uh, that I recommend uh, is the problem statement uh, Lean UX. You can find it as you Google it. Uh, it's the Lean UX canvas. You know, it talks about the business problem. It talks about the business outcomes. It talks about the users. It talks about uh, the solutions. Uh, sorry, the user outcomes and benefits. Then the solutions. Then what's the most important thing we need to learn first? And uh, then we're talking about what's the least amount of work to learn the next most important thing. This is a really nice little tool. Okay, if you haven't done this exercise yet, do it. Do it after this call. Get your co-founders, get your team members, whoever you have or yourself, go do this exercise. Get a whiteboard, draw it up, put post-its, get Miro, Miro, whatever you call it, and uh, an online whiteboard, do this exercise. It's going to help you a lot. Okay, so the Lean UX canvas, I kind of went through it. Uh, I'll send this out later after as well. Um, you can find all this information, but it's it's kind of what I've gone through. There's a little bit of description on it, but I, I do want to win time to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A, okay? But this will be sent out. I'm sure Nadine will be very kind enough uh, to make sure that you all get this. Plus, there will be a recording, um, but you'll get the deck as well. So let's just think about research methodology after the Lean UX canvas. You know, you have secondary research and primary research. This, I'm going to start with the secondary research. It's the internet research and observation, right? There's quantitative and qualitative data, okay? So there's numbers, but there's also feelings and stuff like that. You do competitive analysis. I hope you all done that already, right? There is heuristic evaluation, which you can Google, okay? But that's going to be all on qualitative data. The primary search is where you are doing surveys, okay? Uh, you're, uh, you moderate interviews and you do unmoderated interviews, okay? These two type of uh, categories of, of research is very important, okay? And why is that important? Is you're starting to understand what you see on my screen right now, right? So the behavior, what users do. So that if I go, let me see if I can do this, yeah. So behavior is what users do, right? And um, also attitudinal, what users say, okay? So it's very important because we say different things, but we do different things, okay? We all wanna be amazing at something, and we say that, but maybe we don't do those actions, okay? And this happens with your users as well, okay? And then the qualitative insights and the quantitative validation. So in between is where all those little tricks for research is, you know, observations, competitive analysis, usability studies, diary studies, video diaries, in-depth interviews. You have even eye tracking. I don't know if, if you've ever tried that. A-B testing, obviously. All these are different types of research that really helps us understand the user, okay? Cool. So funnels, I spoke about it, so I'm not going to dig too much into it, but there is an issue about funnels, okay? Funnels, they create strategic silos. They just go down, okay? Uh, funnels create functional and metric silos, and funnels push us to invest in linear activities, okay? So we do a campaign, people calm down, so maybe you've heard the leaky bucket. You might have certain people leaking through the bucket, right? Not finishing the funnel. And if the funnel is finished, you know, Tim came in from a campaign. I have acquired him. You know, he signed up, he's paid money, and that's it. So you've, I mean, you gain Tim, but you can gain so much more from Tim. Okay. What can you gain from Tim is you can have a loop. Okay. So we're going to show very quickly loops. I hope you've seen this already. If you haven't, it's a good. Uh, it's a good thing to learn. And if you've already, I hope it's going to help you um, remember a little bit how to make sure that you think about loops because there's different types of loop, the acquisition loop, 
All right, so I'm going to dig into it a little bit. Acquisition loops, they could be viral loops, content loops, paid loops, and sales loops, okay? In acquisition, we have four types of different loops. All right. So let's talk about the viral loops because we all want this at the, at the end of the day, okay? Um, and that goes with word of mouth, organic, incentivized, or casual contact, okay? So I think I have a little thing here. The basic generic viral loop is somebody signs up, a certain percentage of them invite friends, a certain percentage of them click on those invites, creating new signups and repeating the steps of the loop. So that never finishes. If Tim comes, there's a big chance Tim is going to bring somebody else and the other person is going to bring somebody else, right? So you've created a loop. And that's when you find growth loops in your company, that's where you're going to scale. That's where like the biggest, biggest of these unicorns that we speak about, that's what they found. They found loops. They found growth loops. So a viral loop example, again, it's new signups. Okay, they click, they invite their friends, the other ones uh, uh, click on the invite, goes back, goes back, goes back. Okay, that's not the, but an example of Slack, if you know Slack, if you're using already Slack, is Slack was huge in this and I have a case study at the end as well. It's, uh, you know, uh, new users sign up, a percentage of those uh, invite their team. Suddenly so there's other people, okay? They invite their team members, they click on the invite, they come in, okay? And it just keeps going. So if you get one person, in a team, you're going to get the rest of the team. And potentially, there's a lot of word, word of mouth on Slack, which I'm going to show at the end, is that they'll tell another company that they're sitting with, they're like, oh, what are you doing on your phone? Oh, I'm, I'm on Slack. Oh, what is Slack? Well, that's where we do all our company communication. And they're like, oh, shit. Well, we still do emails or we have Google Chat. It's horrible. Google Chat is really bad. Um, and they're like, oh, okay, let, let me get Slack. And then boom, you got somebody else, right? The loop continues. So let me give a bit more of a B2B example. I don't know if you know Drift. Drift is a type of chatbot, uh, but it's been the one and most successful chatbot ever because it's for sales, right? It helps people sell more on their website. Um, here, new users sign up, okay? A percentage of users who click on Drift branding sign up to become customers, okay? Because if you go to a website and you have a chatbot and then you see it's powered by Drift, you click on it, you go sign up yourself. You create a chatbot yourself or your website and you embed it, right? You make sure it's on your site and somebody else clicks the branding again. And then it's a vicious loop, right? It's not vicious, it's really good for you, right? For your company, okay? So then we have content loops. What are content loops? Is user-generated content, UGC, when we talk about UGC, that creates uh, SEO, right? Search engine optimization. A UGC that creates social, right? Social uh, people share and so on. And we have CGC, which is company generated content. Okay. And that we don't do enough. Okay. When you have a team of 50 people, if you had good content and you make sure that your team members on LinkedIn or wherever they are, they, they like your content, they'll share it. Right. That's also a channel. And that's also a loop, it's a content loop, okay? And again, the same thing on a CGC, company-generated content on social, okay? So this is a content loop, an example of content loop. You know, a new user sign up uh, to something, they create content, um, the Google Google indexes that content, uh, people find that content, and then they sign up as well, okay? That happens a lot with platforms like, of course, Yelp. Yeah, Yelp is in the US, so we have TripAdvisor, we have a bunch of these type of things. Uh, you know, uh, restaurant reviews and so on. So um, new users sign up, they create the content, Google indexes it, people find the content and then people are like, oh, okay, I'm going to create the same thing. I'm going to write a review. I'm going to, I have a restaurant. My friend has a restaurant, whatever, okay? Um, so then when we talk about CGC, company-generated content, is a new lead or a follower, okay? Percentage that view content convert to a lead or follower through downloadable eBooks and other methods. Okay, so you have all these things on your site, you know, downloadables, ebooks, PDFs, and so on. Okay, uh, so that content is created, uh, the company creates this content, the content is distributed. Okay, the users amplify that by sharing it on social emails. Hey, Rezek, did you see this latest ebook by XYZ company? I've learned so much from it. Like, wow, yeah, that's good. I'm gonna send it to a, a few friends. Okay, boom, I have new visitors, right? Rezek is gonna go to that site, it's gonna love that ebook, he's gonna go to that site, and then the same thing is gonna start happening again. Loop, 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 loop. Okay, the best example was HubSpot. Yeah, HubSpot. 
they've done this really well. You know, they they created so much content. They created little mini products. Even they created, you know, uh, was it uh, create a signature, email signature dot com or something like that by HubSpot. You know, and then you'd have this in your signature. You make a free signature that looks really nice, and it says powered by HubSpot. And then you click on it, and you're like, oh, I want to create mine. You know, and so on. Okay. Cool. Uh, so paid loops. Okay, paid loops, we know them. I'm not going to really dig, but it's Facebook, Google, paid content placement, TV as well as, as a paid loop, right? Uh, paid marketing loops. Uh, you can check them out yourself. This is Clash of Clans. You know, new users sign up, a percentage of pays. They buy more ads. They act on the ad and new users sign up. Okay, this is all about spending money on ads, getting some return um, on the ads and making sure that those people also come in, okay? All right, sales loops, which are very, very important, is your inbound sales, your outbound sales, and your channel partnerships, okay? Uh, we do have a masterclass or a deep dive, I think, uh, about revenue growth system. That is going to be, I think, later on uh, in August or something like that, or even maybe September, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, you should check that out if you're really uh, interested in how to combine inbound, outbound, and, and so on uh, to grow revenue. So sales loop, simple, new customer, uh, they add a rep. So if I get enough uh, customers, I have enough money to get a new salesperson. If I get a new salesperson, they work some new leads. If the new lead comes and they become a customer, I have more budget, I can get more salespeople. Okay, this is the old school methodology a little bit, okay? I make this much money, that gives me another salesperson, that salesperson brings me this much money, then I can get another salesperson and I can scale my sales team according to that. And that's how you scale your revenue. It's good, but I think it's even better when you combine it with things, right? When you combine a content, a company generated content loop with a sales loop, right? So that you have the HubSpot loop and then suddenly the HubSpot loop, according to that, they have the leads being worked as you can see in the middle, right? Uh, and then those closers, they have more budget, they get more salespeople, more content appears, more people come. And then these two loops, they work together, right? And they feed each other. And as they feed, as they feed each other, it just keeps generating revenue for you, okay? Which when you find these loops, separate loops, they work well. And if you can combine them, that's where I think the magic happens. <laughs> That works. Okay, that's where the magic happens. Okay, I'm, I'm trying my new effects. I hope you like them. I'm not sure about them yet, but uh, so that's you know if you do find those two loops getting together, you you're on the right trajectory. I can tell you, you're gonna grow. You're gonna grow. Okay. Cool. So LinkedIn is uh, our dear LinkedIn that we all know of. I think right. I hope we all know of LinkedIn has done this really well because they have a bunch of loops that works together. Okay. Um, you know, you build your network as a viral loop, uh, um, user generated content, the user profiles. Okay. We do bios and so on. Then there's B2B products, which is the sales side of things. And they also have publishing. Okay. So LinkedIn combines all these things according to the time, as you can see, as you build your network, then you generate content. Then you start buying ads or things like that from LinkedIn, or you do your webinars and so on. That's their kind of B2B products. And then also publishing uh, newsletters on LinkedIn and so on. So as they do, they combine these multiple acquisition loops. LinkedIn became massive, right? Even if it's shit, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm using that word again. But LinkedIn is is really bad. If you go on the Messenger, you know I have 13k followers almost. I can't follow any conversation, right? So don't message me on LinkedIn. Email me, okay? Uh, because it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But that's the that's the best platform okay and they've really done it really well by having all those people and combining these loops together airbnb we all know airbnb i hope you all stayed in an airbnb an incredible experience right same thing they have multiple loops they have a viral loop a user generated content loop a paid loop and a viral loop again you know you give you get you invite people you host landing pages uh you do paid marketing through it and then you invite for trips other friends right? If you're going on a trip, I've booked this. They're like, oh, invite your friends. So they have it on their thing. Boom, those people are invited. I mean, if they didn't know Airbnb already, well, a lot of people know Airbnb now. Okay. So so that's kind of 
what we have on the loops, but I want to touch on user psychology a little bit because again, on growth and growth mindset and stuff like that, it's all about psychology, right? Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in this subject at all. Um, but if you do understand the basics and there's a bunch of really good books out there, like growth by, um, Carol, Carol Dweck, I think growth, you know, uh, amazing book to start understanding a uh, growth mindsets, a bit of psychology and so on. So here, I'm just going to touch on, upon history, what history tells us. Okay. The first referral was in 1935, right? It was the first money chain letter appeared, the infamous send a dime, which flooded the world within a few months. Okay. So this was actually the first referral. You know, you'd put the name, you put the address of somebody else. Okay. And then you refer some, somebody new. That was the first referral program was in 1935. Can you believe that? There was obviously no internet, right? Um, again, on referrals, then we had Airbnb and Dropbox, both big success, which we know, but to, to, to remind ourselves, because if you don't have a referral program and, and, and you are solving a really good pro uh, problem, a lot of other pro people have these problems and potentially the people that you solve the problems of, they know that other people have these problems and they're going to have that. They're going to have friends, they're going to have family members, they're going to have acquaintances that has these problems. Okay. So referral programs work really well, not for every company and every industry but it works really well if you haven't experimented experiment okay um so almost any questions can be answered cheaply quickly and finally by a test campaign and that's the way to answer them not by arguments around the table go to the court of last resort the buyers of your product okay this was in 1923 what does this tell me is that really you can just go and experiment right you can test something and don't be shy don't with your co-founder fight about this is not going to work. This is not going to work. This is going to work. This is not going to work. No, don't, don't do that. Just say, why don't we test it? And we're like, okay, great. And make sure that you do what we say, the minimum viable experiment, the MVE instead of MVP. What's the minimum possible you can experiment on? So it doesn't take much of your time, but it gives you the results. If it's a yes or a no. Okay. If you're right or your, your co-founder is right. Okay. Um, so this is optimi optimizedly. It's an experimentation platform. I'm putting some products uh, in between, but it's quite expensive. I don't recommend it at the moment if you don't have great revenue yet, but it's incredible if you have a lot of uh, people already that you can experiment. You can A-B test, multivariant test, not just on marketing campaigns, but on your product as well, right? On your product, on the sign up and so on. Thank you so much, Rizek, for adding that there. Um Cool. So marketplaces, again, why I'm going into this, because, you know, when you think about it, you know, I didn't even know that a few years ago, but in 1882, one of the first grocery marketplaces in the South, how to get supply and demand. Potentially, I think one or two of you are a type of marketplace, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, I've seen some of you on Airtable. I don't know if, you, if you're here, um, but, you know, it's the chicken and egg problem. It's the supply and demand. So you have to think of both sides. That's difficult. Okay, but why I'm saying this is because 100 years ago, marketers created the concepts we use today. Virality, network effects, influencers, cohorts, A-B testing, paid marketing, copywriting, content marketing. These are not new things, right? They were created 100 years ago, right? So, so, so we should be really good at it, but we're not yet. You know, relevant 100 years later, why? Because, very simple, technology changes and people don't all right i'm going to repeat that technology changes a lot and people don't psychology of people we don't change that much you know when you look at how technology ChatGPT and stuff like that is growing and then when you look at people we don't change that much yeah we still have some of the same cultural beliefs and actions that we were doing 100 years ago we're still we're still there okay so that's what i wanted to uh, remind ourselves here um, as we grow our product, we always ask ourselves questions like, how do we increase this conversion rate? How do we increase lifetime value, LTV? How do we increase virality? Right? This is what you guys are thinking, no? I see some heads shaking. I think Nibras is shaking her head as well. So uh, I, see, I see some people understanding that uh, here. Okay. Um, so, but from the customer's view, they're busy with questions like, why should I sign up for this? Should I switch to something else? Should I buy this? Why should I send this to my friends? Okay. So do you see very two different mindsets, you as a business owner and your users 
okay so be careful about this all right this is really really we think like this they think like this okay very important to to, to realize and and accept this because when you accept this that's where you're going to start really start thinking like your users okay so here the job of growth professionals is to help our users or the target audience make decisions to take an action that leads to growth right so our view again is i need to improve retention blah 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 right so which i said and the customer is like should i really buy this you know should i send this to my friend very different views that's your view our view and that's the customer's view okay so so these are two different views okay so we have to be really careful and the growth is really being able to translate this into these questions and answering these questions and as you answer this question should i sign up for this if you answer that question you're growing that's it you're growing okay cool so how people make decisions it hasn't changed okay technology changes humans don't change right people don't change um so you should think about two different things, your growth model, the what, and that's really quantitative perspective, you know, numbers, right? You all have a spreadsheet, I bet. I bet. You all have a spreadsheet with your signups, with your revenue, with how many people did a free trial and so on. That's great, but that's just your what. And then you also have, obviously, the, the other half of the equation, which is the user psychology, the why. Our user psychology map provides the qualitative view of why our users or customers take the action that cause our business to grow. So you have to have these two things, the what as metrics in a sheet and potentially a, 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 a whiteboard or a customer journey or something like that on a user psychology. Why? Why are they going to take the next action? You know, when do you expect them to take the next action and why are they taking the next action? Okay, very important to think about. Am I going too fast or every, everybody's okay? Yeah, awesome. Awesome, great. I love seeing thumbs up. Uh, so these two factors, they work together as a team, okay? So when I say our growth model is ours here, everybody at, at the core program helps us answer questions like this. What is the highest, highest impact area to work on? If we increase X variable, what happens to Y output, right? So when you have these two together, you can start really asking these type of questions and answering these questions, okay? Before you can't really, okay? Because before you're gonna ask, like, how do I increase this? But here is why is the impact, uh, why is the highest impact area to work on? What is the one? Okay, you're prioritizing and so on because you know the why, but you know the what as well. Why, why that what is gonna change and what is gonna change because of that why, okay? So this in turn helps us inform that we know of our user psychology so we can answer questions like, again, why would a certain idea increase certain variables? Why do users take this action but not another one? Okay. When you start to think about these, that's where you're doing growth. That's where you're doing user psychology. This is where your growth model, okay, it helps you and your user psychology it helps you. Okay, these maps and these sheets and so on. You know, just to remind ourselves very quickly. Yeah. Okay, quantitative on a sheet, qualitative on a map. Okay, and then you put them together. And as the map, as people go through the map, a number changes on the sheet. Okay, and as numbers change on the sheet, somebody's going through a map. They're going through a journey. Cool, let me just get back here. Key question, how do we understand, evaluate, and improve decision-making of our users? Okay, because that's your goals, right? Is to understand them, evaluate, and improve the decision-making of users or customers, whatever you want to call them, okay? So a very simple framework, you can research about this, is the ELMR framework. Emotion, logic, motivation, and reward, okay? The ELMR framework, thank you so much, Rizek. Again. Google it, ask chat GPT, ask uh, Bing search, whatever, you know, dig into it, learn it. You'll find templates. You'll find other people talking about it and so on. Okay. E-L-M-R. All right. Uh, so we're here at monetization. All right. Because we said that we we're going to get into monetization. Uh, we still have good time as well. So I'm quite excited. Um, let me double check. Yes. All right. So monetization. Okay. Uh, which I think you all suddenly, I saw some eyes open up. They're like, yes, money. Uh, and and <laughs> we're all here for money at the end of the day. Let's be honest. 
you know, we do want to solve problems, but we want to make money because if you don't have money, you can't eat food. If you can't eat food, you don't live and so on, right? This is the really the vicious circle of the reality of life, you know, especially if you live in Turkey, the inflation rates are 90% plus, you know, every two weeks, every, every price changes. Um, you know, so monetization is very, very, very important for every startup, for every company, for every service, for literally everybody. Okay. Um, so what are some tips and tricks and techniques and strategies on monetization? So first of all, let's talk about the pitfalls. Okay. There's four pitfalls of monetization. Okay. To view viewing monetization in a silo from acquisition and retention. Monetization is part of the system. Okay. It enables, disables acquisition and retention strategies. Okay. So monetization is not on its own. You don't just think about monetization. You think about it for, of course, your acquisition and retention. A lot of people think they can think about the acquisition part, but they don't think about the retention part when they think about monetization. One other mistake that we do, and I've done it many times, is copying competitors. How much is my competitor charging? That's really bad. Okay, looking at competitors and assuming they've defined the right model of competence because potentially your competitor copied another competitor and the other competitor didn't even do the research at first, right? So you're all in the wrong monetization strategy. You're all in the wrong price uh, and you're not going to get far. You're going to grow a little bit. You're going to plateau at some point and you're like, mm, why? When you change money, you know, the pricing of your product, things change a lot. Uh, trust me, you know. I've in a company in the B2B marketing automation platform for e-commerce that I mentioned to you at Cards Guru in Barcelona about four or five years ago. So a couple of years before COVID happened. Um, I had an amazing CEO. I was the I was the CEO of the chief uh, operating officer. And before that, I was his consultant. I was his growth consultant. And um, every day I would come into the office and he'd be like, I have a new idea for uh, monetization you know i'm we're changing the price i'm like well yesterday we were changing to this he's like yeah but well, today to this we changed about 186 times 185 times or something like that uh our pricing people were confused our our team members were confused maybe that was a bit too much i think it was a bit uh ocd about changing the, the pricing all the time um don't change it that much but do test it every two weeks if you have enough traffic test different um, pricings okay but understand why you're testing these okay and the other couple of things is you know we guess guessing at what the right price price structure and experience is we go oh, i'm gonna charge 49 dollars a month for this how do you know that well i've guessed it you know i have other products that are similar no Okay, that's a guessing game and we're not as growth people we're not here to guess okay we can have assumptions but we are going to validate these assumptions. Okay, so assumptions are good. All right. um, and viewing monetization just as price. Price is just one of four comp components in monetization. And that's what I'm gonna uh, show you guys now, okay? Cool. All right, I'm just gonna drink some water. Been speaking for 50 plus minutes now. <clears throat> All right, so more than how much you charge, these are the four models, right, that make up your model. Actually, these are the four uh, things or components that uh, it makes up your model, okay? So the, the model is very simple, okay, is how you charge, you know, is it ads, trans transactions, subscription, right? You know, how do you charge people? When do you charge them? Do you charge them on an upfront? Do you charge, a, do you do a free trial? Do you do a freemium? Okay. And what do you charge for? Do you charge for contacts, API calls, features? What do you charge for? For volume, right? Uh, and the amount you charge, that's the price. Okay. We all think about the amount, but we forget about the how, when, what, and the amount. Okay. The combination of these four is monetization. Can I do a mic drop? So that's mic drop. Okay, the combination of these four is monetization. I repeat, even if I drop that mic, I'll pick it back up. Okay, um, so let's dig into that a tiny bit. Okay, you can always have a model friction spectrum. Okay, and um, each of the elements of your model has a level of friction. Okay, low friction. Okay, on the left to high friction, which is my beautiful handwriting there. 
okay so the what okay the known stuff and the high friction is the new stuff so if something is so new is a bit more high friction the amount of course uh arpu is average revenue per user okay so when it's ten dollars it's low friction we can all just pay ten dollars sometimes we even forget about our ten dollar subscriptions okay but when we go to you know a hundred thousand dollars average revenue per account it's super high friction is your sales cycle grows and so on and it's very difficult and the when is the freemium is low friction the free trial is is not high friction it's in the middle but the upfront payments some companies do upfront yearly pay payments uh like salesforce and so on that's very high friction okay how do we charge them by ads is low friction because we serve ads there's usually return transaction is in the middle and high friction is subscription because i subscribe uh, to something recurring okay so thinking about where do you stand in the uh, in the friction spectrum is very very important also okay so there we go different combinations uh are different frictions we can combine the elements in a lot of different ways all right so instagram right it's free. it's they charge for ads it's free right it's a known product okay you share pictures photos um and their their average revenue per account is actually ten dollars it says okay not many people because not many people advertise but they have a lot of users all right okay so the average is is, is low that's instagram mailchimp i think has changed quite a bit but it's a subscription okay they have a freemium model it is a known you're sending emails anyways right and then it's about a thousand average revenue per user a little bit more in the mid spectrum of a friction right because it does have a freemium and so on and but then you have workday right workday is an annual subscription it's upfront okay it's known because you do need that in your work in bigger companies i think uh and it's 100k average revenue per account per user i'm sorry so that's much higher okay so the balancing our model with acquisition is very important we need to balance our model with the influence or cost of our acquisition channels so on the left side you have cost and influence on the acquisition okay and on the right you have your model okay your how when what amount all right we have to balance these out okay so you also have to balance your model with your core value proposition okay uh, we need to balance our model with the friction frequency of our core value prop so on the left we have on the product we have friction and frequency that's our product it's weighing down and then we have to make sure that the how when what amount on our on our monetization model balances it out okay we can see here uh balancing our model with the market segment okay we need to balance our model with the size of our market segment okay maybe you have a small market or you have a big market you have to know these things okay so again same thing here um the segment and so on is going to weigh out your model you'll have these you can search a little bit more about these you'll find a lot of stuff out there um just to go a little bit faster balancing our model with acquisition again you know we need to balance our model with the influence cost of our acquisition channel okay here the acquisition is lighter the model is a bit heavier with the core value prop okay again same thing i do re re repeat that the frequency the friction and frequency uh, of it is much lighter the model is heavier you're gonna you're gonna have some more problems okay so do i i just want to show you, you these balances as a psychology a little bit you know to be like hmm, I, need, I need to think about this you know what's my product what's my what's the freak the friction the frequency of usage and what's my model if you're charging you know 59 if you're charging 150 dollars a month for a product that i'm going to use once a month is, is a lot but if i'm going to use it every day you know uh let's talk about it you know it's much better you know like a product like notion you know you pay was it 150 a year if you are on, on the paid plan or something like that i use it every day oh my god you know that's like it's almost cheap you know they could they could scale it further the, the pricing would still pay for it okay we would okay like the chat gpt stuff you know the plus is 20 dollars a month i would give 200 today i'm sorry you know me and my colleagues we always say you know we say if they wanted more money we'll give it you know because we use it day in day out i use it two to three hours a day 
All right. So the monetization pyramid, uh, on the bottom, you have your monetization strategy, how to think about your monetizing strategy and how it fits into the overall picture of your growth model, which we just saw, okay? Then you have measuring your monetization, of course, how to measure monetization, no matter what your model and strategy looks like, okay? And monetization measuring is not just the price, don't forget, okay? Uh, defining and changing different pieces of our model with actual analysis rather than guesswork. So the how, what, when, and so on is, you know, you should understand each and define them and test new things and so on and be able to measure it, of course. So you understand if something's gone better, something's gone worse and so on. Uh, okay, I love this part. All right. Okay, so we're going to talk about this part. How's everybody at the moment? All good? Everybody's soaking in the information? Yeah. Awesome. I see some smiles, some head shakes. Nice. Everybody's focused. I love it. All right, cool. So um, market product channel model fit framework. I'm throwing a lot of frameworks and a lot of thinking to you guys. And I know it's just because we have only an hour and a half and I want to give you the most value I can. All right. I used to teach this in university in Barcelona and it was a six week course. I've, I've kind of summarized it into an hour and a half. So, so bear with me. Okay. All right. So if, if you have questions after you can ask, and also there's a coaching program as Rizek mentioned, um, where you can take an hour of my time and we'll dig into exactly what's relevant to you as well. Okay. So, uh, so what's needed to build a hundred million dollar plus company. That's what we all want to do. It's not easy. It, it's going to seem easy now, but it's not easy. I'll tell you that, but I'm going to, I'm going to simplify it, but, uh, you know, the, the, I think the strategy and, and the, 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 the mindset and model is easier, but the execution is where it's difficult. And, and we all, we all struggle on execution. We all have amazing ideas. Okay. Um, you know, having amazing ideas doesn't make you grow, but having consistent actions every day is what makes you grow. So here, what we have is we have market product channel and model. We just spoke about the model, right? So you all have this. This is what you all think about, I think, right? Product market fit, right? Who knows about product market fit? Yeah, product market fit. Anybody didn't think about product market fit? No? Everybody thought, thought about product market fit. That's good, okay? Have you thought about, okay, let, before we get into that, product market fit is one of many fits needed to build a $100 million company, right? You all thought about this, but this is only uh, one, okay? Have you thought about product channel fit? Yeah, okay, Mohammed has. Anybody else has thought about product channel fit? Not many. Some people are like, hmm, okay, okay. Some Saif maybe did as well, I think. Yeah, so some people are like, oh, okay, what, what does he mean? Okay, products are built to fit channels, not the way, uh, not the other way around, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, you're building a product, so that, okay, um, so let me explain. So um, you're building a product, and then you want this product uh, to be advertised on advertising channels or you build a product and you want this product to be advertised on billboards and TVs, but they have no fit whatsoever, right? Because you're you're showing, uh, let's say you're showing a, um, I don't know, you're showing something like, a, uh, like ChatGPT on a billboard uh, in the traffic. Okay, and a lot of people are not going to understand it. They're not your fit. Okay, so ChatGPT is not for billboards, but ChatGPT is for word of mouth. Word of mouth is a channel, right? And ChatGPT is for content, right? And what happens is everybody on YouTube talks about ChatGPT, right? So there is a product channel fit there. Okay, uh, it's an example. I can see if I can think about other examples, but do think about your product and think about the channels that you're advertising on where, you know, which channels are you using and see if they are actually a fit. Okay. Because the channel, you're not going to be able to change the channel, right? You might find a new channel, but you're not going to be able to tweak the channel and make the channel fit your product. Okay. Product channel fit. Products are built to fit channels. Channels do not mold to products. Okay. So maybe you're in the wrong channel. Okay. So here, just to go a little bit, product channel fit, products mold. So B2C SEO, users create hundreds of thousands of unique pieces of public content that others search for, okay? Viral, inherent benefit to having your network use the product, appeals to large percentage of users' network, quick time to value, 
and then paid quick time to value short feedback loops okay so you do have to think about paid viral or b2c seo according to what your product is okay we saw a bit of viral we saw a bit of paid uh, we didn't dig into b2c seo much um but i'm sure that you guys know about it okay and why i'm bringing this because at the end of the day it all is for acquisition right so the product acquisition and in the middle is where you want to be right that's where it's going to happen so your product channel fit your um product market fit product model fit and so on and even channel model fit is uh what's going to bring you revenue okay so um, market product channel model fit framework still now we're talking about model channel fit we talked about the model right we talked about the monetization and it's not just price and so on so model enables or disables certain channels and even loops yeah we saw some some, some like linkedin had many loops that works why because their model works really well on the channel which is social professional networking social and so on and works really well okay so i'm bringing this back here okay because i want to remind you about uh, you know that your model with the acquisition it has to fit right to, to start having this combination of all these four boxes that you see you need to remember to balance stuff okay at the at the end of the day we all want to make a lot of money but sometimes it's not about making a lot of money from 10 people but maybe it's from a 1000 people a bit less money but it's going to be at the end at 10000 people you're going to make the same money but it's better because it's more of a fit for your product for your model and so on okay again these are very psychological things to think about and to map out it's not going to make sense to pot potentially now but when you take a, a marker and you go to a whiteboard and you start drawing these things out and you put your price you put your where do you charge how do you charge them and stuff then you're going to be like oh, oh shit this this crazy guy tim showed us these kind of models and now it makes sense okay you need to put your own numbers you need to put your own post-its okay so the model channel fit spectrum i'm just going back at this and i'm going to go back to the four fits framework because we're going to start matching them in different places now okay uh just to remind ourselves the model channel fit that we were just talking about okay so the low model friction uh, the low customer acquisition cost okay is on the viral b2c seo that we we're thinking about facebook whatsapp yelp okay when we go on paid we go to like draft kings and dollar shave club e-commerce and stuff like that okay gamification e-commerce it's on the, on, on the paid we're, we're we're getting a little bit more friction now okay higher uh, customer acquisition cost is b2b content inside sales okay the hubspot uh the zendesk customer support platform and so on and then we're going even crazier on palantir which is a very enterprise product okay enterprise sales high friction okay but they make their channel and their model fit to that as well okay because they're high friction they're going to think very differently than a low friction company okay so not last okay uh because this is definitely not last we're going to start combining them you're going to see now but your model has to uh, fit the market okay model enables and disables certain market segments okay according to your model you'll find the market as well okay and you have to make sure that the market you're going for fits the model that you have okay that when how how to how to charge them when to charge them how much to charge them and stuff has to fit the market okay you can't go to a turkish market and charge 50 dollars for a a tool that i don't know does xyz but you can go to a uk market and it's going to fit right so you have to rethink if you're going to go geographically into certain places to also change your model Palantir signed a 500 million deal with Philips a week ago. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're high friction, but they just signed a $500 million deal. Right. I bet you they're, they're happy. <laughs> you know, even if they're high friction, they knew they're high friction. According to that, they go for big deals, you know, high customer acquisition costs. I bet you they flew multiple times to their offices, to each other. Many people flew. They went out in restaurants and stuff like that, and they made the deal. Right. I've done that in um, big data for telcos. You know, I've done deals with Samsung and stuff like that. And, you know, they would come to Barcelona, would take them out, dinner, blah, blah, blah. And then you make a deal. Hopefully, if you're charging $9 a month, you don't do that. 
right? But if you're charging $90,000 a month, you might want to do that, okay? So that's kind of the psychology behind that as well. So um, all good. Oh, did we go back? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, cool. So a model market fit, okay? So according to your one-year average revenue per user, okay? And according to number of customers needed, all right? On the right side on here, as you can see, you have a model market fit. And if you don't have, you're lacking model market fit, you're not going to become a $100 million company. So you have to think about your uh, average revenue per user and then the number of customers you need. And that's what Rezek just mentioned about Palantir, right? So they don't need as many. They need those big deals. They're going to be around, around here, okay? Because they're going to get deals at a few person. Like they're going to be somewhere here. Maybe they're going to get you know, 10,000 clients or they're going to get 1,000 clients, but the clients are paying them 1 million plus. You know, maybe they're going to get 100 clients, right? They're still fitting, right? But maybe your product is $1,000 and you're going to get only 100 clients. You don't have that product, right? You're not going to become that company. So in the four fits framework, then you start combining different areas. So your product and model fit, okay? So model product fit, important, all right? So it's not just these four boxes that run into each other, okay? But they also speak to each other and they make sure that they fit together as well all right uh why do i keep getting this random no okay something ah, here we go that's what i wanted to show um so the model friction x value prop friction okay again another a little x y here you know on the left side you're going to have your model friction you know the low to high and on the bottom you have your core value proposition friction okay so here you have the high model friction a higher high core value prop friction okay so you're kind of good here you have low core value prop friction but you know uh, the model is high friction you're in trouble okay here is okay you have low model friction low core value prop friction easy stuff okay these are the places that you want to be in okay so think about what's the friction in your core value proposition and what's the friction in your model which we just saw as well and you know just to mess with your brains you know, uh, this is it. You know, this is how it has to, everything has to fit. Okay. So the market, product market fit, product channel fit, model channel fit, model market fit, mo market channel fit, model product fit. These all has to happen. Okay. You know, and, and these this does happen in companies like HubSpot and Palantir and stuff like that. Okay. They do think about this, even with high friction, according to that, is a, is a, is, a, is a difficult market they go for because they know that Philips is not going to deal uh, with somebody every year. It's going to be a long term deal as well and so on. OK, so that's that's a good example. Cool. I'm going to take a bit of water again and breathe and you can also breathe. OK, let's continue. All right. So I've. I mentioned a few of those case studies just very quickly. What I wanted to say, you know, Airbnb, we all know Airbnb, so I'm not going to explain you what Airbnb is, but their key strategy was their referral program. Okay. They also had a photography program. If you guys know in California, that really worked really well in the, in the early days, they would go and take photography for free to make the listings much better. But um, as a result of, of their referral program, their customer base increased dramatically in the first year after introducing the program. Their bookings increased by 25% worldwide and over 900% in some markets. Okay. So a key lesson, I didn't bring the whole um, case studies. I just brought a key, key lesson. Leverage existing user base to acquire new customers. You might have already 10 users, 100 users. Go ask them for other users. We don't do that often. If you go to a, a client that is happy and you're like, hey, do you have anybody else? You can just do it on an email even, or a phone call one next time, you're like, hey, you love the product? I do love the product. Can you get me one more person? They will do it. Most of the time they will do it. If they like the product, they will do it. Incentivizing users can result in significant growth. You can give them a 10% obviously discount or a month free or an extra little gift or send them a t-shirt if they love your brand, you know. Personalize and make sharing easy for users, okay. Um, so uh, Slack's organic growth through word of mouth. Okay, we saw a bit on the referral and on the loop and stuff like that. But actually what happened with Slack is they, they grew primarily through customer recommendations. Okay, people used, uh, people that used Slack, they loved it. You know, when we start using it after email, we loved it. We're like, oh my God, so much better than email. So by 2019, less than five years after they launched, 
Slack had over 10 million daily active users, all primarily driven by word of mouth referrals. Okay. Key lessons, quality product can lead to organic growth. So focus on the quality of your product. Word of mouth is a powerful growth tool when users love your product. Again, I do mention users have to love your product and you have to understand the users, obviously. User experience is key in driving organic growth. That's Slack really to learn from. Uh, Canva, I'm using Canva today. I love Canva now, uh, especially since they have their AI stuff and all that. Uh, Canva's growth through user-friendly design and content marketing. Uh, we all know Canva, hopefully. You know, Can Canva leveraged uh, content marketing to drive its growth. They created an online design school, okay, and with free courses and free tutorials and blog posts about design. And not only did this provide value for their users, it also improved their SEO and drove a lot of organic traffic to their site. Okay, key lessons. User-friendly product design can help attract and retain users. Content marketing can be a powerful driver of organic traffic and growth. Providing value to your users can improve your brand image and drive growth. Last buffer, uh, but definitely not least. Uh, do we guys know buffer as a social uh, media platform type of thing? Theirs is very interesting because it was very different. It was through transparency and customer service. Customer service does happen, but transparency, that was, I think they were like one of the first players that did that, you know? Um, so they were really transparent with their numbers. So early on, Buffer made the name for itself by being radically transparent. Um, they were sharing everything from the revenue numbers to its employees' salaries. Everything was transparent at Buffer. You can find all the information. This transparency helped them differentiate Buffer from other companies and help them build trust with their users, which drove growth. Right? Um, they also emphasized excellent customer service from the very beginning. That was one of their uh, key thing. You know that they went the extra mile to help their users, uh, and they were able to build a strong and loyal user base. Even if Hootsuite was better or whatever, if you were using Buffer, you wouldn't leave Buffer. Okay. So key lessons here is transparency can help build trust with your users and differentiate you from competitors. Excellent customer service can help attract and retain users. Building a loyal user base can drive sustained growth. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think I think we are at question time. Nice. Amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. So guys, we have around 15 minutes for Q&A. So please, if any has any question, just raise your hand and uh, we'll tend to that. Any questions? Feel free, guys, to, to just, you know, it's usually the first question, Rizek. Uh, after the first question comes, then everybody asks questions. But the first yeah. question, nobody ever wants to ask the first question. It's so funny. I have this in every, like, even in public speaking with 1,000 people. Okay. Nobody asks, and then one person asks, and then suddenly everybody starts asking questions. So so let's find that one legend that is going to ask a question. Uh, we'll wait for uh, 20 seconds. If uh, no one asks any question, I'll, 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 go, I'll go ahead. You'll ask a question if not. Yes, yes. Guys, think about your business. Think about what we... we Guys, we... ask about your businesses. I'm pretty sure you have 101 questions on your mind. So feel free just to unmute yourselves and just ask a question because... Don't, don't be it shy. Is, I mean, you tackle towards your businesses. So product-led growth, feel free to ask about tactics, strategies... Uh, highlight your business model to to Tam and ask for a quick recommendation. Come on, guys. All right, I'll go ahead. Uh, Tam, is is there a specific? And I know, uh, uh, I know that there is a specific kind of strategy when it comes to 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 you know the exponential growth of your product as per your industry or discipline, and and and. For instance, if we're talking about content content creation, right? Mm. If it's a platform about content creation or uh, e-commerce, e-commerce, or yep. uh, further, they're just it's a SaaS, you know, it's B two B. What are the recommended kind of channels or routes to pursue as per the industry or or, or the sector you're at? 
Well, I think that uh, you kind of said it yourself. If you're doing content creation and so on, um, you have to eat your own dog food. So you have to be really good at content. You know, if you're helping other people to create content and you have a platform for content creation, uh, you should be a legend in content. Um, and I think that's the great example of Canva, right? They're a design con content. Uh, design is also content. And they had amazing content out there. They had amazing courses. They had amazing free material, free templates. You know, they had so much content out there that was free that would bring you into Canva. So um, I think that the best example here is eat your own dog food, if that makes sense for everybody. You know, if you're doing something, yeah. make sure you're really, you're, if you're providing some, something to other people, make sure you're really good at it yourself. Awesome. And another question, uh, Tam, and it might be good to, you know, uh, for everyone to 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 hear the answer. When it comes to optimizing kind of digital channels for any business, what are the major failure factors that businesses tend to, you know, uh, do and, and fail and, and how to avoid that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing question. Um, so I think that the, the biggest failure I've seen is that they'll do a um, an optimization that is huge, that is going to take them three months, six months, and they're like, yeah, but in six months, it's going to be great. And then six months come in, and then the market change, the users change, you've lost all your users, you've lost your revenue, and that optimization still hasn't happened. Uh, and then you, and then you like go to your investors, and you're like, can I have a bit more money, please? <laughs> you know, and then, and then they're like, yeah, but you asked this last time, yeah, but we're doing this optimization of the product and so on. And, and, yeah. and, and that's where you're going to lose trust. So the best way to do that is take that optimization and possibly the optimization is to, to change the whole UX of your product, right? The user experience of your product to redesign it. You don't have to redesign the whole thing in one go. You might want to just redesign the sign-up process. You might just uh -huh. want to redesign the monetization uh -huh. process. You might want to just redesign on how to click a plus and create a post if it's, we're talking uh -huh. about content platform or something like that. So break down that huge optimization that you have in your mind because we we are dreamers as humans. We dream of the best. We're like, my product's going to look like this is going to be the best thing ever. Right. Uh -huh. That best thing ever is not today, it's not tomorrow, it's in six months, it's in a year. Yeah. Right. Um, so 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 uh, iterate very fast, iterate quickly and, and do a lot of iterations. You know, every every week release something new. I just fixed the button and I just fixed that. That's okay. Cause a few of your users are gonna see it and they're gonna be like, Oh, wow, they fixed that little problem I had. Great. Yeah. Then they're gonna even tell you, Oh, my next problem is this. So then you're gonna be able even to to prioritize what you're building, what you're optimizing, what you're fixing, instead of just waiting for that whole six months. I'm talking about product here, but same thing as channels, you know, um, when you're doing acquisition and so on, you might want to start a new campaign on YouTube. You want to do a YouTube channel because you're going to do some really good stuff and you're like, I need a videographer. I need, I need a great uh, software to stream. I need this. I need that. No, you don't need that. Right. And 90 90 percent of the things that you need, you actually have it. You have a webcam, you have a laptop, you have a mic, or you have just the air AirPods or whatever. Just start it. You know, start the channel, start do the thing. Don't wait for that time. Don't wait for six months. I, I'm not sure if that answers uh, your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It answers the question. But another aspect that I was thinking of, uh, Tim, while you were you yeah. kind of answering the question is that. Basically, startups at different stages tend to to think about optimizing kind of digital presence for customer acquisition. But later on, two years down the line, uh, they figure that, you know, I'm acquiring customers, but the churn rate is, is <laughs> increasing. And yeah. it's, it's I, I believe it's kind of, you know, uh, a cycle that and a loop that they should close. For both kind of users, the new joiners or the new customers, and uh, the, to to retain the other kind of users on on their uh, platforms or solutions, and and can you just shed some light on that, please? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I think that happens a lot. That happens in every business that I've I've helped. It's you know oh I'm acquiring a uh, hundred customer a month, you know, uh, but ninety uh, ninety of those customers in six months are gone. Um, so you keep acquiring 100, 100, 100, but 90, 90, 90, all right, they keep going. Okay, you're keeping 10, 10, 10, 10, which is not bad. But if you did a little bit of tweak on retention or the activation or, you know, somehow um, 
on your customer support even, right? Oh. You might keep suddenly 20 and not 10. You might have doubled the people that you keep. That you keep. And if you do that, you will see that, uh, you know, suddenly 10 plus 10 is 20, but 20 plus 20 is 40, right? Uh, and as you go along, you're going to keep growing much faster, much better. Um, but I think that it's a big mistake. This is why that was that marketing example that I had in the beginning, right? Um, that we think about acquisition um, a lot and we don't think about, you know, the activation. We don't think about retention, um, you know, or we give uh, this this thought process to other people. Uh, we give, you know, the customers support the retention and not to growth people or to marketing people. Um, you know, and we're always like, oh, let's bring new business, new business, new business, new business. Um, that new business. And sometimes it's like when you're, let's bring a new business and you're just not ready for that. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Oh, 100%. 100%. You're getting an enterprise client and you're going to start building custom things for the enterprise client and you yep. were not ready for that. But but the money uh, that the money that they offered in the beginning was a no-brainer for you. You're like, oh, they're going to pay me $100,000. Exactly. I need this money now. And then six months later, you're like, oh, I should have never gotten that money because we couldn't build the product. The customer is not yeah. happy. Uh, you couldn't yeah. customize the things. So um, this is why I think also the model fit and stuff that we were talking about, the product model and product market and stuff like that, you know, don't just go for somebody shows you a little cash, you know, make sure that they are fit, you know, make sure that that client actually also just to go back even more simpler Make sure that a client is coming for the value that you're giving today. Sure. Not sure. for the value also, that you're gonna give tomorrow in the future. You know, don't don't do it in a promise of value. D make sure that also. today you're fixing a problem, right? And they're loving that. They're like, oh my god, you're already fixed a big problem for me. I'm happy to pay you. Amazing. I mean, have these on top after, you know, but it's not like oh, I'm coming because I want you to build this because it's gonna match my company and my, you know. And you start customizing for each com uh, company and you've lost your vision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that happens a lot. All right, Tim. So we have a question from Omar Jarrah. Omar, please go ahead. And if you can turn on your camera to see your beautiful oh. face, that would be amazing. Yeah, I don't think I can do that at the moment. My face isn't that beautiful, though. Just so okay. you know, Tim. So you don't get too excited. It's not that. Okay. Yeah. Then go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm kind of working on like two projects at the moment. So I'm going to ask about one of them. Uh, just as a background, the idea is to, um, I want to build a platform. Uh, and the idea behind it is to bring in uh, foreign investor capital into agricultural projects in the MENA region. And, and, I mentioned, and I remember you mentioned at the very beginning that um, you should really understand your uh, customer base and like people you're dealing with in my case i guess i have like two main people which are the investors and the you know farmland owners yeah and, and i and i and i and i find it easier to understand the farmland owners because i can talk to them casually and the idea of okay like what do you want to do next what are you missing how much capital do you need what are the yep. challenges you're facing but i don't really understand how i can understand what pain or, or like what exactly are the problems of the investors like i can only assume using research because it doesn't make sense to me to go to an investor without the full product being fully pledged you know and having the uh, farms lined up so um how do i basically do this how do i make sure that i understand what the investors need in a conversation where my 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 product is not you know yep. fully developed and the the company is not fully operational uh, and and Omar, just to to kind of facilitate the conversation between both uh, both of you uh, tem and yourself and just uh, for the sake of time because uh, tem has to jump on another call in 3 minutes yeah. i'll let them just give you a very high level and tend to a question on the chat and you can uh, book a one on one session with them a yeah. coaching session Absolutely, but Rezek, I can answer this very, very yeah. uh, quickly, and I think that uh, it's going to make sense. Hopefully, let's see. You are you are a marketplace. At the end of the day, you have farmers sure. that needs investment. You have investors that wants to put money somewhere, right? So you can't make that mistake of just understanding the farmer. You're going to have to understand the investor for sure, and you got that right. You know, so you're having this challenge. Make sure that you understand that because as you understand the farmer, you don't understand the investor. You're really good with the farmers, but you're not good with the investors. So that has to grow. Equal. So if you already understood the farmer until here, make sure you understand also the investor until here. Um, but I'll give you a very quick little hack if you want. Investors wants to make money from their money. That's about it. 
right? They don't have much more in their mind. And hopefully they want to be a sustainability. Hopefully they want to help the world a little bit with their money, which usually I have this much money. Sorry, I have this much money. I want to make more of, of that money with this money, right? So that's the mindset of an investor, 90% uh, plus of the time. Um, and um, and so, so think about that. But also you're very lucky because you're not the only one doing this. Right in Africa, uh, somewhere I forgot now. The other day, uh, I had a few people come to me, and they're doing something similar. You know, they go to local farms uh, and they bring in money uh, to create products that are locally distributed and so on. Go and find other people doing this and ask them the question. You know, um, because you might not be a competitor, because you might be competitor. You are in this region; they're on that region. You can share knowledge. We don't do this enough because we are a little bit selfish and arrogant as humans, and we don't go and ask for help, right? So go ask to somebody else doing this in another region and say, hey, I am struggling with this. I'd love to understand more about these type of investors. Do you have information? You'll be impressed. You might have some really good uh, chats with that person. Yeah, or, or Tim, I was advising uh, Omar to do kind of mystery shopping with the competition. You yeah. know, just yeah, just yeah. go through 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 the whole process, like as if yeah. so at, at at some point, as if he's the investor, and the uh, other point, as if he's the farmer, and really understand kind of the blind spots uh, at, the, at the journey, and and try hundred percent, Rizek, hundred percent. I think that that's another way to do it. But also, we always forget. Why don't we just ask someone? You know, why don't we ask yep. for help? You know, we don't do this enough. Sure. But, you know, why don't we go to 100 investors and say, hey, guys, I'm struggling a little bit because I don't know what you guys are looking for, even to the investor or to a potential competitor somewhere else. Um, when we ask for help, usually people like to help. Awesome. And and Tam, just one last yeah, question I before we that. wrap up. Yeah. Chalet is asking, yeah. what's the most effective strategy to initiate viral word of mouth? I think, I think that's really been a painkiller you know, that massive painkiller. Uh, and it's also being something that it's mind blowing. You know, chat GPT was mind blowing, uh, but a painkiller slack killed the pain of emails, you know, um, and that created word of mouth, you know, so really the word of mouth, you have to, or have an amazing product. It has to have an amazing experience, or you have to really solve a deep, 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 deep problem that we all have. Amazing, Tim. And by that, guys, I would like to thank you uh, for attending the session. Please take a minute to just fill uh, the assessment uh, form that Nadine just sent over uh, the chat and see you in our next session. Thank you so much, Tim. Such an interesting and, and insightful session as always. And see you soon, my friend. Thank you very much, Rizik, Nadine, and everybody here, uh, also for the good questions at the end. And